Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our graduation seminar at Uzugi University Graduation Studio. Uh, today, we are hosting Matt Bell from University of Maryland, uh, Uzugi Zguvanci, who is PhD candidate at the Faculty of Architecture and Design um, of Uzugi University, is going to introduce our guest. Oh, you're not going to read all that, are you? Please. <laughs> just the bottom, just the bottom. <laughs> hey, Matthew Bell is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a member of the Congress for the New Urbanism. His professional work has received awards from the American Institute of Architects, the Congress for the New Urbanism, the USGBC, the Urban Land Institute for Committee for 100 on the Federal City, Bell has degrees in architecture and urban design from the University of Notre Dame and Cornell University. He currently serves on the Historic Preservation Review Board in Washington, D.C., appointed by Mayor Muriel Bowser. And the floor is yours. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. And a special hello there to Professor Latini. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, let's see here. And can you all see my screen? Yes, it's just, thank you. All good? Okay. So thanks for having me. Um, Professor Kami's asked me to talk about designing um, civic buildings, and I have four projects I want to show you all. Uh, two are large master plans, and two are uh, buildings that have a master plan sort of way of thinking about them. And um, then maybe if we have time, show a little bit of an entry. I'd love for your reaction to uh, a competition we did, you all probably know about for uh, Taxim Square a few years ago. I'm a practicing architect as well as a professor of architecture at the University of Maryland. And I practice with a firm called Perkins Eastman. Um, let's see here, can I? Yeah, uh, Perkins Eastman, and most of the work I'm gonna show is Perkins Eastman work. We have, um, uh, about actually about 1200 uh, employees all over the world and a number of different offices um we uh the sun never sets on perkins eastman this is just some public relations material about the firm but what's important is all the locations we're in a lot of places in the united states in the middle east india china and south america um but one of the things that's interesting about perkins eastman it has diverse practice areas and these could range from healthcare to K-12 work, you know, uh, elementary school work to commercial real estate development. But what I do is I sort of cut across all of those and I practice really at the scale of the city and combine program types into making great places. What I try and do is work with people that have particular area expertise and use that to make good urban designs. Um, and I hope, hope to show you what I mean by that. The two scales we operate at are probably pretty understandable through these two pictures. If you've been to New York City and you've been to Times Square, you've probably seen the, the TKTS pavilion where they sell tickets to Broadway shows. And it's an amphitheater as well for, for tourists and others to hang out in, in Times Square. And that's the sort of placemaking at the scale of the very small urban space. But also the firm works as well at urban design projects. And on the right side, is Battery Park City, which was designed by one of my partners, Stan Eckstutt, who is a sort of brilliant urban tactician. Uh, Battery Park City was one of the first uh, projects to really use the fabric of the adjacent city to make a new urban design. Um, and um, it's a very, very important project, at least in the evolution of urban design in the United States. But I sort of travel between these two scales. Um, but just let's back up a second and talk a little bit about what really undergirds a lot of what we do, which is the predicament we find ourselves in the planet, that we have a survivability issue relative to our futures. And we have to do things every day to make sure that what we're doing is making the world a better place and a more survivable place and deal with issues of climate change um, in our architectural practice. Um, America has a huge problem of suburban sprawl on the left side. And what this means is that most people cannot live without driving cars everywhere they go for whatever needs they have. 
we've really become quite specialized in making non-walkable cities. And for that reason, we have an environmental crisis as well as a healthcare crisis. We have people that can't walk anywhere um, to live, um, except maybe to their neighbor's house to borrow a quart of milk. On the right side, though, is an interesting analysis of this uh, from uh, the Berkeley's uh, Cool Climate site. And one of the things that they're able to document is uh, CO2 produced per household um, um, down to zip code and individual buildings and streets and things. And what's interesting about this is green is good and red is bad. And what you can see is the cities, by and large, and this is up and down the east mid-Atlantic of the United States, the cities are places that are much more um, environmentally um, beneficial for the planet because the they you can live without moving a car and um, you can get all your daily needs in most cities by walking. And it has a much greater uh, sort of green ratio there that you can see in tons of CO2 per household and that the suburban areas are, are quite bad and those are the red areas. So with the, armed with this knowledge, what we try to do is reinforce uh, the livability of the city that we're in. And while, um, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of interesting um, advances in the design of individual buildings from solar panels to um, geothermal things and capturing rainwater and things for us, at least for me, and that's all very important for individual buildings. But for me, I, I think it's equally important to build cities that are worth living in. Um, and that the city as a sort of idea is really worth fighting for. And it's it's a better place socially. It's a better place in terms of raising children. Um, it's a better place in terms of, as I mentioned before with the Berkeley slide, in terms of climate. So where I am is largely on the right side, although we do a lot of things as well for sustainable individual buildings. But my practice is really geared towards making the city a more sustainable place. Uh, to that end, we pride ourselves in our local Washington, D.C. office in doing work that adds to the livability of the city. And this is a map of Washington, D.C. here. And you can see all the projects that we've been involved in um, to make this place a more livable city. Everything from master planning to historic preservation and renovation to residential buildings to um, school buildings and university buildings. And what we're really trying to do is add step by step, block by block, uh, buildings and urban designs that make the city of Washington, D.C. a more livable place. And that's really pretty much a large part of our focus relative to the sort of projects that we do and the um, attitudes that we take. And we take a lot of pride in this. And we, you know, I remember a few years ago, we had a graduation speaker at Maryland, and he said, You have a choice in your career. You can either take what you love doing and try and do it in as many places as possible, or you can find a place you love and try and make it through the projects that you do better and better with each project. And I sort of adopted the second one, which is really not to take my work nationally, although I do have some projects outside of Washington, but really to focus a lot of what we do in the livability of our hometown. So I'm going to show you four efforts here, um, two are master plans and two are buildings, um, and give you an idea of the kind of work that we do and the sort of um, emphasis that we take relative to doing these projects. Everything we do in, is informed by master planning, whether it's an individual building or a large master plan. Everything we do is about really understanding the relationship of the building to its site and in particular with civic buildings like schools and libraries, really understand how the public nature of that building is orchestrated for public benefit. So um, one of our most noteworthy projects is a project called The Wharf, which is a rebuilding of a waterfront on uh, the Washington Channel on DC's waterfront, um, which has now been completed. It's about 3.3 million square feet of development, everything from residential development to hotels, to condominiums, to office buildings, but all uh, undergirded by a lively retail uh, level at the ground floor and also lots of waterfront activities. And this has been led by my partner, Stan Eckstead. I had the good fortune of working with Stan on the early phases of the master planning of this project, and it's been completed. We, we first got the project in 2006 
and last year they finished the second phase of it. So it it's taken a long time for this to be realized. Um, and this is a view of the war for the first phase. And you can see what this project really sets to do is to make a very significant public environment along the street, along Wharf Street there, and then connect to the water maritime activities here. There are two private yacht clubs here. And then also bring the city to the water through streets and blocks that connect back to the urban fabric of Washington, D.C. beyond. And also note that we invited a lot of different architects to do buildings as part of the wharf. This is a Perkins Eastman building, and this is a Perkins Eastman building. But the rest of these are all by other architects because we feel like real city fabric is designed by a lot of different architects. So you can see this is Con Pedersen and Fox. This is BBGM. This is the Smith Group. This is um, uh, this is the Arena Stage, which Bing Tom did a did a renovation of. And then here you can see what it was like early on, and that's where Phase Two has been constructed. So you can see all the different activities that happen. There's a there's a water taxi, public water taxi, a public pier for events here, and then a sort of recreation pier here, which has a lot of recreation activities on it. So this is a little bit of the facts of it. Um, it required um, a number of acts of the United States Congress relative to some of the land disposition, but that gives you an idea of some of the program involved with the wharf. Uh, this is a picture of what the wharf was like at the end of the eight, eight well, probably, yeah, probably the mid 18th, 19th century, excuse me, um, where this is the Potomac River out here, and this is the channel, and this is all the landfill being built, which became Haynes Point. In Washington, and this was one of the primary places where merchandise came into Washington D.C. And you can see all the different ships and all the different sort of merchant ships coming in there. And the U.S. Capitol was sort of off in this direction. Um, what happened, of course, is that there was a large movement in America in the 1950s and 60s to do urban renewal, and the wharf was subject to urban renewal, and much of the maritime industries that were there were demolished as was a significant neighborhood nearby, which was largely African-American. Highways were put in. You can see the beginning of the, one of the highways here. And this whole area was redone in the 1950s and 60s in a, in, a, in a not very nice way. It was very brutal what they did to the people living here. But what they took was they turned a sort of thriving maritime area into a sort of uh, almost suburban shopping mall on the waterfront here. And this is what it looked like um, prior to uh, our intervention with the master plan. And here you can see the, the, uh, the old remnants of the old DC market, which is still there today. Much of this was rebuilt as sort of modernist Corbusian style buildings. These are buildings by IM Pei, which lead up to this area. And then on the right side, you can see the highway that was put through in this neighborhood uh, to connect other parts of the city um, across uh, to the state of Virginia, across the river. Uh, so pretty brutal planning and pretty pretty um, uh, devastating to a lot of the people that live there. The, the, the wharf was part of a kind of overall Anacostia waterfront initiative, which is what AWI stands for, meaning that it, it had a number of different goals. And it was part of a large master plan to make the Anacostia River, which is this piece of the river here, a better waterfront. And this was largely the brainchild of Mayor Anthony Williams when he became mayor of the city. One of the things you might know about Washington is that it was planned, this is a, a sketch of at least a version of the L'Enfant plan. It was planned before railroads came in. So the idea was you were gonna come up the Potomac River and there would be landings along the Anacostia here and then you would take a canal and the canal could land you at the base of Capitol Hill and get you to the Capitol or down to the White House and then out again. Of course, the Anacostia River famously silted up and railroads came um, in the 1840s. So it was a little bit less important that this system be um, used. But what happened was the city developed a sort of industrial waterfront along the Potomac River. Uh, one of the things about Washington is that there's an immense amount of jurisdictional overlap in the city. So you have a lot of different agencies that are responsible for different parts of it. And one of the things that was really important and getting this plan developed was to have coordination among the federal and local agencies. So you can see here the U.S. Navy has some land and the District of Columbia and the federal uh, uh, GSA, the General Services Administration, 
So all of these had to be coordinated and that coordination was led by the city planning office in Washington. And of course, what's really important when you do big waterfront plans is to have a really clear idea of where you're going. So after a period of time, they came up with four major goals, a clean river, access to the river, a park system, distinct places and cultural destinations and sustainable and strong waterfront neighborhoods because the city had been cut off from the waterfront for so long. So this is the Anacostia waterfront plan and it involved all the way from what was the football stadium all the way through down the Anacostia, the US Navy yard, this is called the yards now, there's a baseball stadium now right in this location here and then around here, and then this is the wharf here, which is the piece that, that I was showing pictures of. And this gives you a sense of what that whole plan was like. It was an immense undertaking of a lot of different planning, probably five or six different master planning teams working on each area, trying really hard to bring the city to the water so that the water could become an amenity like it is in many European cities, but very rarely in American cities. So, one of the things that happened was we were able to secure an American baseball team and put the new baseball stadium as part of the new waterfront here. This is where the Nats play, the Nationals here. They relocated the team from Montreal, so that helped it. And the wharf area is this area over here. And that's what phase one looks like today. And really the idea is a simple 60 foot wide wharf street, which is a shared street, a Wunor for cars and pedestrians. And then a variety of architecture, but the most important part is how the buildings really um, define the, the ground level. So this is one of the master plan drawings, and you can see most of the major streets that enter have connections to the water. The idea was to make small blocks and small spaces in between, not make big sweeping spaces. Washington, D.C. has many, many very large spaces, but very few small spaces here to engage the sort of the theater over here. This is a building by Raphael Vignoli's office, and this is by shop architects here. So this is phase two from here onward here, and to engage this park down at this end. But really the big idea, and these buildings look very shapey, but the big idea really was to have a consistent street wall or a street wall at the lower level that engages the waterfront. One of the most important things I ever learned from Stan Exta was that to make a waterfront place, you have to have a water plan because what happens on the land is very important to what happens, it's very dependent upon what happens on the water. So this is a plan we did early on to look at all the different water uses and how we could categorize each of those and would give us some ideas about how to program and plan for what happened on the, on the land side. So this is the first phase under construction. What's interesting about this is the developer decided that instead of doing the project one building at a time, that they would do it um, several buildings so that when the first phase opened up, you really had a sense of place defined by many buildings and many public spaces rather than just one building at a time. We always make a kind of drawing that shows the places because the public as Stan always says, the public places are the places that have the most value. And we always try and name those places so that they, we can figure out what the character is. So the idea being that the buildings, yes, the buildings are important, but what's most important is the way the buildings make public space. So that's one of the entry places here with these sort of large kind of sails almost as, as lighting features. That's the That fountain is actually the entrance to the parking deck underneath you come up through a fountain there. I'll show you that in a second. And this is Wharf Street. And you can see the way in which the careful attention has been paid to the first two floors of the building to engage the public realm in a very significant and um, um, overt manner there. Um, and then these are some of the side streets. Some of the side streets have retail on them. Some of them have parking entries. Some of them have loading docks. The idea was really to mix it all up. And some of the streets are even covered uh, to make them pleasant places to walk as well. <clears throat> and this is looking back from the main pier towards the Anthem, which is the performance venue. There's a 6,000 person performance venue in the middle of this residential building. So there's a big uh, hall inside with the residential wrapping it. Lots of sound attenuation was necessary there. And the first night, opening night, they had the Foo Fighters go in and, and play a concert. And this shows the pier outside that. And you can see how 
close the buildings are to the waterfront. 60 feet is a really important dimension. You don't, you, lots of times in urban design, you're faced with the problem of making things smaller rather than bigger. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a section through there. All of the stormwater is captured before it goes off into the creek. And I don't have a picture of that, but there's a very significant amount of environmental work done at the edge here. But there are two levels of parking that go all the way underneath all the buildings. And this is sort of a big bathtub underneath it here. And you can see it extends all the way underneath it. And when you go and park in one of these, we wanted to make the experience up from the parking deck to be a nice one. So that fountain I showed earlier sort of slips down into the parking deck. So it becomes a sort of nicer experience for the minute you leave your car. And then that's the Foo Fighters on the first night at the Anthem, which is this building on the left, which is the building designed by Perkins Eastman. And then just quickly, this shows the, the auditorium on the inside and how that's wrapped by residential development. And they have an upper level resident terrace above all of that with a lot of uh, vibration control and sound control necessary to make sure this building is a place you can live in. And that's Wharf Street. Here's another view of it. And these are all the firms that have been involved here. Uh, Perkins Eastman was the master planner and the coordinating architect for all these landscape architects and architecture firms. And we, we coordinated the design of all the underneath of the buildings so that the parking deck could extend underneath all of the buildings rather than have each building have a separate parking uh, configuration. And then this is the, the, the second phase. This is shop, these two buildings here, and this is Vignoli here. And this is um, some of the public spaces that are created there along the street. So the next project I wanna show you is a slightly smaller project that deals with a lot of industrial archeology span um, called Macmillan. Uh, Macmillan is a project that is called so because it was a sand filtration site for fresh drinking water in the city of Washington, DC, something that was championed by Senator Macmillan um, who was one of the advocates behind the Senate Park Commission plan of 1903, which brought a new park system to Washington. But the big idea of this site was to bring originally fresh water, drinking water into the city and filtrate it through sand on this site so it could be pumped out to residents throughout the rest of the city. So this is our rendering here. And you can see what it is, consists of is a large public park, a community center, which we designed. And then we have one developer doing uh, row houses and another developer doing multifamily senior building with a with a uh, uh, supermarket in the lower levels. And these buildings back here are medical office buildings that relate to the medical center across the street. So it's really a <clears throat> mixed use project, but it had to deal with really preserving the, a number of the historic elements that are part of this site. So this is where it's located. It's in uptown Washington. This is North Capitol Street here. So if you turned around and looked in this direction, you would see the U US Capitol. And there's a number of small neighborhoods as well as a large medical center across the street. And the reservoir here is where a lot of the fresh drinking water came from. And this site was de decommissioned by the United States federal government in the 1970s. It was no longer needed and sold to the District of Columbia for their uses. And this is our master plan. And the big idea of the master plan was to preserve the two service courts here and here, which have these cylindrical buildings and um, uh, some of the some of the pumping equipment for the uh, for the underground network, and then expose some of the underground network over here, preserve one of the underground cells here, and I'll show you what they are in a second. And then Frederick Longstead Jr. was commissioned at one point to provide a kind of landscape plan around the perimeter of the site. And so we, we are reinstituting the uh, Longstead plan for the perimeter of the site. The idea was that this would be a site that people could promenade around the, the edge of, but they wouldn't be allowed to walk in the center because there's a number of manholes that allowed sand to be poured down into these filtration cells. So this is what it looked like prior to um, uh, redevelopment. Uh, the city falls, the, the idea is this is almost like a big deck of an aircraft carrier here, and it stays level, and all these are underground filtration cells underneath, and the pumping equipment is above it here. And the this part across First Street is still in working order today, but this part, as I mentioned, was decommissioned. 
So this is the site would look like before redevelopment. And you can see here, this is all the places where sand would be stored and then wheelbarrows would be brought into these openings and then put down into the cells underneath and exchanged out. And then they would open these manhole covers, about a third of them would be opened at a time to switch the sand in and out once the sand captured the impurities of the water and did its job filtering the water. And then there are these little hatches all along. So this, you can see a little bit of the operations here when the place was in, in operation. You can see the, the equipment they used to move sand in and out of the filtration cells. Um, it's a little bit of a kind of bizarre landscape with these highly abstract cylinders and then punctuated by these small little brick huts that have no floors that have all the, the uh, pumping equipment inside them. Yeah. And what we did was we developed a taxonomy of architectural elements of all the different characteristic pieces of, of each of these, these elements there so that we could develop an architectural language that would be sy sympathetic with these, with these um, historic characteristics. And underground, this is the original structure, and this is the, the, the grass that you see up above. And then underground is this concrete structure, and the sand would be here, and the water would be filtered through the sand and then taken out for clean drinking water. And this technology is no longer used. They use a chemical technology. But the challenge here is that this is unreinforced concrete. This is, there's no steel here, and you wouldn't want steel with water in this location. So the challenge was, well, you know, what do you do with this? Because you can't put buildings on top of it because you can't um, support it and you can't reinforce it because that would alter the historic character of it. So what was decided was that we would preserve one entire cell and parts of another cell. All the cells, there are 20 of them on the site. They're all the same. So preserving one would be like preserving 20 because you couldn't visit all 20 at the same time. So this is the underground network of one cell, which has some rather remarkable uh, poured in place concrete structure to it. And we'll be preserving a, a very large feature of the site in one of those cells. And the site has an interesting geomorphology as well. It has some creeks that run across the site from the lead down into the Potomac River. This is a diagram that was done by uh, Nelson Bird Waltz, our landscape architect to explain aspects of that. Um, and the site was flattened. This shows what the topography was like prior to the building of this. And this shows, here's, here's all 20 of the cells here. And you can see the way they're divided up with their manhole covers. And then you can see how it was flattened there. It was a recreation space. There was embellishments like fountains and walkways and things. And the idea was like cemeteries in the 19th century that you would promenade around the site. And they put the trees in so people would not be um, encouraged to walk across the site because the site was quite dangerous. So some of it has collapsed. Um, the uh, one side of it has collapsed. Uh, the uh, reinforced the lack of reinforcing makes it susceptible to um, earthquakes and other kinds of shocks. So it has had some subsidence in various places there. Um, this is, you know, what it looked like until recently. The site's under construction today. But you can see the, the Olmstead walkways kind of disappeared here. And you can see the walkways that were put in so that people would stay off the cells, off the manhole covers, and could promenade around the site. And it has a very significant berm because, of course, as we know, it has to be level because of the characteristics of water. So this is what it was a little overgrown until about a couple of years ago here. And so we developed four different approaches, health, water, preservation, and sustainability, I won't go into all of these, but this is a figure ground of the, of the site um, as it is going to be developed here. So this is the preserved site here on the corner. It allows for a view into the first the upper service court that shows the, the um, cylinders for sand washing and things. And then we preserve this one as well. And the community center is located here. And this will be a six acre park, which has a lower level that opens for views out to North Capitol Street. So that's the program of it. And the idea was to make three very distinct development ideas. The, um, the, the thought was that the sites already divided up into these three major zones. So we felt having a very uh, different development idea for each of those zones would be important. And they're linked by these small streets. These are very, very small streets that link the North and the South together. 
and this will be the major public asset with a playground, the community center, and kind of a water park for stormwater treatment and other things down at this lower level. This gives you a sense of the program involved from healthcare to residential, a true mixed use program. And we will have retail and a grocery store in this first portion here. And there'll be perhaps some museum or cultural uses um, in each of the, the historic um, sand filters and the pump houses there. And this is a sense of what the park system is going to be like all the way throughout. So it'll be, a, you know, the site is 50% of it, believe it or not, is actual open park open space, which will be a significant benefit for the community. And this gives you a three-dimensional sort of view of what this is like uh, showing the community center. And what we were thinking with the community center was like the sort of simple platonic geometry of the cylinders. We would make something very simple there. These are solid. We thought maybe make this out of glass as a kind of contrast to that, but something that could relate in character to the simplicity of the buildings on the site. And we developed a sort of analysis of each of the uh, pieces of the existing site to sort of use those to set up the architects develop ideas for their buildings there with the vegetation and the framed openings and the plinth and various things. And then to bind it all together, we made a design guidelines um, that has a material palette so that the small buildings, the medium sized buildings and the large buildings would have a sense of cohesion in terms of their color palette. And this was very important to the Historic Preservation Review Board because they said that the landmark site, which is a historic landmark, needs to stand out differently from the fabric around it so people can see the cohesion of it. So we developed this taxonomy of elements and also uh, the color palette. And these are some of the views of what this might be like in the future with the upper service court here showing the retail things. And this is the lower level here showing the cylinders and the retail and some of the spaces between them that will be used and a paving that relates to the gridding of some of the things I showed earlier. A lot of things really trying to pick up on the thematic aspects of it. And we didn't design, the only building we designed was the community center and the master plan. And this is also a project that has lots of different architects. Uh, so this is, these are the townhouses here. And then this is the community center, which has a sort of very simple form, as I mentioned, as a stair that goes from one level of a park to the next level here. And this opens up to North Capitol Street, so you'll be able to see in and see all the activity here. And the pool of this building is right here, so you'll see into the community, into the community pool. The entrance to this building is framed by one of the historic gateways down into the sand filters there. And then this is the uh, the uh, uh, playground, which has a sort of playful form of the uh, cylinders there, which you can see in orange on the left. And then the aerial view of the whole ensemble. And one of the things that was really important was to get these townhouses to, instead of like they do in America, where every townhouse is different, to have them relate to each other in discernible patterns, not unlike the patterns that you see throughout the site. And that took a little bit of doing with the townhouse developer, because that's not how they're used to doing business here in America. And that's the, the view of the lower level of the pool and the community center there. And then the section here, which shows how that pool level relates to one level of the of the park, and then the upper level sort of relates to the um, upper level of the park, and we'll be preserving some of the cells and exposing them as part of the experience of the site. More of that view. And this is what you would see along North Capitol Street, the community center, and then you'll see the exposed structure of the filtration cells at the lower level. And we even tried to use concrete to make the bridges through the site to mimic the sort of way concrete was used in earlier iterations of the life of the site. But really an emphasis on the public spaces more than anything, trying to use the space between the buildings. So those are two master plans, just quickly two building projects. This is a public high school in Washington, DC. Uh, this is the original version of this public high school. This was uh, Dunbar High School, which in the days of segregation was the highest performing high school for the African-American community in Washington. And you may know that um, until the uh, Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court judgment, um, schools in most American cities were segregated. Blacks could go to one school and whites could go to another school. 
And this school was built in 1917. There were previous versions of it, but this particular one was built in 1917 and had um, probably the most uh, significant uh, number of alumni to contribute to make major contributions to life and culture in the United States be graduates. This building built in seven, 1917 was torn down in 1977 to make way for a, a, a rather unfortunate building, which I think I have a picture of. But the way the building was organized, the historic building was it had a kind of H-shaped configuration and an axial relationship to their sports field. And the lower level had a kind of open um, columnar space that they called the armory, which they used for uh, dances and all sorts of events uh, for the community of the school. Um, that building was replaced in 1977 by this building on the right, which most of the students referred to it as the jail or the prison. And the idea of this building is an open plan school building. And the idea of it was to um, have minimal amount of windows on the outside so that the social problems of the neighborhood wouldn't seem so present and to have all the open space focused inward so the students could, could concentrate on their studies. You could imagine what that was like as a school to go to school in, not very nice. And it also had 25 um, stair, uh, fire stairs in it, which was a nightmare for the principal to uh, be able to kind of keep an eye on. So it was a very, very bad building. And what it did to this building was it blocked off a L'Enfant Street. So this is a L'Enfant Street, O Street, that used to go through and they built this building right across that street. So this is our plan. What we did was we opened up the street here and we did a couple of things. We tried to establish an axial relationship of the gym and the auditorium to the sports field like the 1917 building. But more importantly, we focused the building towards the south. This, this building here, you entered in here and you can see the shadow there and the microclimate of that on a, on a winter's day was terrible about five degrees colder here when students were standing outside waiting to go in. So what we did was there's a public park across the street. We sort of, even though it's not part of the school property, we said, well, we're going to make it seem like part of the school property because we're going to put the main entrance south facing, facing the park. So this works as almost like a giant forecourt into the building. We have our armory space here, classroom wing, and then uh, gymnasium and auditorium spaces there and the idea was to make the the building to find the public plaza of the space outside and to, to recapture not remake but recapture the spirit of the 1917 building and this is a diagram we made um, showing how the interior of the building relates to the sports field and how the front door and the armory space relates out to the park the park and recreation park across the street really two essential um, aspects of the of the design. So that's the front plaza. This is the entrance here. This is the Hall of Fame. Dunbar has a Hall of Fame in the lower level. Uh, the sort of administrative offices are here. And this is this little temple piece on the corner, which is the library. And then there's a sort of um, classroom wing, which is we thought of as a kind of repetitive loggia uh, with repetitive classroom modules. And the building really is a sort of collection of different um, different uh, spatial types. There's a kind of loggia type, which is the classroom wing. There's the temple over here in the corner, which is the media center library here. And then there's a sort of courtyard building here, which has the uh, gymnasium and the pool and also the auditorium. And then this is like the piazza. Here where all these different typologically different elements come together. And here is the eating area, the cafeteria, and there's a bridge that mimics the angle of New Jersey Avenue over on the left side here that connects all of this together. So one of the things you have to do in urban schools is you have to be able to stack program uses. So the pool is below the gymnasium there because you don't have a big site. Lots of American high schools are built on 30 some odd acres. Uh, this is on nine acres, so it's a much tighter site. Uh, this is the classroom wing with the science labs on one side and the regular classrooms on the other side. But the idea was to go vertical rather than horizontal. And you can see this is the football field here. There's the pool at the lower level and the, and the, uh, the gymnasium space above it. It has a performative aspect as well. The football field is a location for about over 300 geothermal wells here, which power a great deal of the school. 
and they go down to a depth of the height of the Washington Monument, so the football field has a pool purpose. And we have some cisterns to collect rainwater that are located outside the building there that are the size of school buses. So the building has a very strong performative aspect to it. This is the auditorium space on the inside there. And then this is the cafeteria space. And we didn't make a separate cafeteria. They used part of this plaza or the armory space to put the um, uh, eating areas in. And this took a little bit of a little bit of um, doing with the school administration who wanted a separate closable space. And this has worked out to be quite good for the school because it also has a visual relationship to the career counseling office. And you can see all the different university pennants in the windows of that office. And then the school is named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was an important African-American poet. Um, and then we have the wall of fame here of all the Dunbar graduates, some, a lot of significant people on that wall of fame. And some of them are actually listed in these plaques in the floor, but some of the plaques are void, don't have names in them. And the implication being that one of these students someday might have their name as part of this hall of fame in the, in the space. And that's the view out to the uh, football field. This is the media center. Um, it doesn't have any books in it, which is sort of too bad, but um, they eventually got some. But what's interesting here is that these are all the Dunbar alumni who have appeared on United States postage stamps, very important people from, from military folks to physicians and researchers and educators. It has the highest number of high school graduates uh, of its alumni that have ever appeared on United States postage stamps. And then this is the senior lounge looking back over the park. To the to the south there and then we were trying to not remake this sort of Tudor high school but to have some elements of it like bay windows here to have those the kind of presence that those things offer the street to recreate the sensibility of Dunbar if not literally the building itself so the last building I want to talk about is a library a 20,000 26,000 square foot library we did in Washington DC it opened up in 2018 uh, this building is a building that replaced an existing library and uh, sits in a neighborhood that pretty much grew of age in the 1920s. Um, it is this neighborhood here, Cleveland Park. There, this is the downtown of Washington. The wharf is right here, what I was just talking about, and D Dunbar is right here, there, and McMillan is, let's see, McMillan is right, uh, if I can find it, yeah, straight up here. McMillan's right here. So this is over here on the Connecticut Avenue corridor, which is a very major corridor leading out to the Maryland suburbs. And the site is in this location. And it's got a lot of kind of houses like this, which are row houses with green front yards and front porches there. Um, the topography of Washington is kind of interesting. It sits in a bowl here like this. And um, uh, this sits on, there's a number of fingers that are sort of tributaries of Rock Creek that comes down here and they sort of have a very strong impact on the definition of what these neighborhoods are like along this line of Connecticut Avenue there. Washington, of course, was famously built in a swamp and British diplomats in the 19th century used to get hardship pay to be posted to Washington because it was considered a tropical climate. Um, this is a sense of it in the Senate Park Commission plan before the area was built um, here. And then I turned the map sideways, but what's interesting about it is that as Connecticut Avenue developed, it developed into five main streets. So you have retail main streets that are separated by about, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 linear feet across. So they each have their own sense of neighborhood there. I actually happen to live right up here, there where I'm speaking to you to, to, from today. And then before you get to Maryland and Chevy Chase, but you can see these fingers of Rock Creek that extend across the city. All, this one almost all the way over to um, Wisconsin Avenue here. This is the Sidwell Friends School where Barack Obama's kids went to school here, but the library site is right there. And you can see it three-dimensionally here. You can see there's tall apartment buildings along Connecticut Avenue, and then the density of the fabric sort of decreases as you go back into the neighborhoods. And that's the site of the library. This was some of the publications of the time on the left for advertising for development out in this part of the world. Um, you know, you can see how it relates to Garden City ideas here. 
these are some of the kind of apartment buildings that were built, big, big uh, apartment buildings, but almost on a garden city model at one level. And then one story retail, you can see in the upper right. And then some larger apartment buildings as well. The old um, library is this building on the right that was built in the 1950s, designed by the city architect. And what it had, aside from the panda out front, is it had this kind of interesting framing of their main window, which was like a big picture window, probably the most identifiable element of the old library. Some of the other buildings are sort of art deco in the neighborhood, like this post office and the, the uh, very famous theater there where outside this theater, I had the opportunity years ago to shake Muhammad Ali's hand, which is interesting, but sort of art deco theaters and, and art deco sort of retail storefronts there. And so this window became sort of an interesting thing to think about because it really pretty much a not very distinguished building aside from this piece. And it was the thing that the community tended to remember most about it, aside from the fact that inside there was no acoustic separation and it was very noisy. So what we try to do is respect the memory of that window and use it in a number of different ways. For bay windows on the outside, to define seating areas on the inside, and even to help define the entry tower on the corner of the building. So this is the building and you can see the way that played out. This is our sort of entry tower on the corner. Here, as you come into Cleveland Park, it sort of marks a gateway here. And then you can see the framing elements of these bays here. The idea to make a fair amount of glass so people could come in and feel invited into the building. And then this piece back here is the large reading room um, on the second floor for the adult collection. One of the things we did was an urban analysis. And this is an area where uh, the, the north-south grid of Washington, D.C., which is in yellow, meets the diagonal of Connecticut Avenue. So you have a right at the Cleveland Park Library, a place where those two ordering systems come together. So what we decided to do was to make the big reading room on the orientation of the houses. So this would be like a giant version of a house here. And to have the rest of the public spaces be sort of triangular or relate back to Connecticut Avenue. So it was important for us, like we would in a master plan, to look at the urban order outside and use that as a basis for the building. And then you can see all the retail establishments um, north and south or on the opposite side of the street and north of the building as well. Uh, we were trying as well, you can see the Rock Creek Park through these buildings here and to connect that view to the main street and to have some civic presence for the building from the Metro to the Uptown Theater, to the um, stanchions at the bridge across the street to relate the iconic nature of the building to some recognizable iconic elements in the community. So that's the corner. So this is a diagram we showed the community that the corner element had to have a uh, very, very um, a strong presence there. So we made this and you can see the, the stone character of it and the brick there, which are characteristic elements. And then the house, was a piece that we articulated in the body of the building. And we put porches on either end to relate to the porches of the residential fabric nearby. Now they're not quite like those are, but at least you can take a book and sit outside on a nice day and read. And they're very, very popular aspects of the building. And when I proposed this to the director of the libraries, I said to him, are you worried people are going to steal books? And he said, no, we'll just buy another book if they toss them off the side of the balcony. So. They're, they've become very, very popular. And this is the, the plan. There's a children's library on one side and they get a garden on the north side. There's a sort of forum space in here where the checkout desk is, a stair on the corner that looks up and down Connecticut Avenue, and then a couple of meeting spaces also on the lower level. But the main idea was you go up the stair into the main adult space, but you look over the community forum space outside. So that's the stair. This shows you a sense of that sequence up to the reading room and you get a view out to the, to the commercial core. Yeah. And this is that reading room where with its porch on one side and you can see the sort of commercial core of Cleveland Park. You can see the way in which we introduce these sort of wood panels to give a warmer sense to the interior, even opening up walls here, there. And then um, this is a view of the north side of the big reading room that relates out to um, the, the rest of the neighborhood fabric with the children's library down below. And this is the, the two porches on either side there that engage the outside. And then this is the community forum space. And the idea here was 
This really had no program in the beginning. We talked them into adding this space. You can see the framing of these little cubbies here or little places people to sit here. And these are four study carols that get borrowed light from the outside of the building. So you can sort of both see out the Connecticut Avenue and they sort of perform a kind of dramatic feature on the inside of the building. More of the, the view of the inside. And that's the children's library here. We, we had a column there that we decorated as a tree to relate to the, to the garden outside with these little lanterns here. And that's the study space on the right here and the stair going up. There's sort of, I call this the Starbucks space where you can hang out with your computer underneath the stair. This is where the new collections get um, displayed. The new books that have arrived get displayed. And the stair is very open and welcoming and light filled there. And there's a sort of balcony level above where the periodicals exist. And the main reading room here, where you can see all the way from the park on one side to the commercial core on the left side, and there are seating areas at either end of the room. And, you know, one of the things that's really important is always to put your building back in scale. And we wanted to make a civic building that had a civic scale. So these are residential and commercial buildings. This is a residential building on either side. So we did this photo montage to show how these, uh, the scale of our building would seem like a civic building, have a larger presence and assert itself more uh, publicly um, in its site. And we did that by showing how it sits related to the scale of the buildings on either side of it. So that's those four projects. And the last thing I wanna end with is a competition we did. Maybe some of you saw this Taxi Square competition a few years ago. We entered it, uh, this, we, I think we did this during COVID. The big idea for us was to increase the park space and to provide more definition to the space around the monument and where the trolley goes all the way around the uh, area there. And of course, you all know this probably better than me, but that's the view of Taxine today here. Um, and it has a lot of buses and taxis and things. And we uh, suggested that this, this road go under here and there be a capping of it with a new market hall and a public loggia. And then what we wanted to suggest was we sort of raise the level of the gardens so we could put a transit center underneath here and sort of clear this space out, still have connections to it, but clear it out so that it didn't have such a such a cacophony of, of, um, of transit things. So we were trying to make a more walkable public space for Taxim Square itself. And that's a view standing about right here looking this way. So this is our, our proposal. We didn't get any prizes. I don't even think anybody looked at our submission, but we made an amphitheater here that leads to the transit center underground here. There's a public loggia and a ramp that goes up here. Um, and then the overlook of this space here where the, where the streetcar is and this um, existing the mosque there with a large market mall. So the idea being that what they really needed was more green space. We did an analysis of the history of the place and evolution over time. We did an analysis of all the transit things going on there, which probably is not accurate, but maybe close enough there. And then this was the, the idea of the square. We, we thought this could be an arts district. We made a kind of curvilinear walk that came all the way around. And then a fountain that could relate to the Ataturk Cultural Center here. Um, and then the buses would go in and out of the transit center here. Maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. We did look at outdoor thermal um, comfort as part of it. And we tried to sort of deconstruct it there to show how it would all go together there. This is our places diagram like we did at the wharf showing all the different activities that occur there and what sort of um, places you could imagine uh, could, could be used to, to remake and extend the green space of the, of the, of the park as well. Um, this was our transit diagram here. You could go in and out of the transit center and the buses could come around and go out here, there with the plaza, different ways to get in. We looked at different planting uh, activities and different ways you could plant this space there. And then we made drawings to try and give an idea of what the public spaces would be like um, with a large market hall and new sort of public uh, amenities all the way along the edges of the space there. This is what it would be like standing in that large loggia overlooking the space here. And this is, we had um, these large poles that had wind turbines on them to generate electricity through the park space here as well, and then tried to define smaller park spaces for cafes and things on the edges. 
and that's a view i think that's the last slide yeah that's a view of the overall here showing the extension of that park space i don't know what's happened with this competition whether the winners are moving forward or not but this was a great way for our young people to sort of sink their teeth into an important space and test out some of their urban design ideas in an international competition and we really enjoyed doing it so that's what i have for you this morning thank you very much uh, matt bell for your presentation uh, we can pick a few comments i will begin by saying that it seems like in all these projects we have seen what is most important is the form of the public space both outside of the building and inside the building so the semi-public whatever halls that you have giving shape to those spaces is a priority in the professional practice that you have illustrated and i do agree with this idea very much so thank you and let's see if we have any comment from the audience Well, I must have I must have really put them to sleep. <laughs> what about uh, Antonio Latini? Are you still there? Yes, I am. I am. Um, well, I, I find it fascinating. It's not a surprise for me because I heard Professor Bad many times, and it's um, I think it's, it's one of the few people that can really master both practice and theory uh, together, and actually. Uh, put theory into practice. These these projects, a couple of them I I knew already. And two are new for me. Um, are really fascinating, extremely elegant, without being gaudy, which is common in our you know um, uh, disciplinary panorama, and with it being banal. Uh, I, I think that this 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 fact that uh, we, live in, we live in spaces and we even when we design buildings we have we actually design spaces as to be um, underlined for our uh, younger colleagues uh, this has to be kept in mind whenever you you design a building you actually design in the space uh, surrounding in front of the building etc this project that i see completely new for me uh, it, it's really uh, of the, uh, I can imagine an extraordinary space. What used to be an inter, probably still an intersection, uh, can become really a place uh, for the larger community to be to, to use, to congregate, to spend uh, time. Um, I don't know. I don't know what happened to this competition. It's been assigned to somebody else now, or is it? Is there any possibility? My understanding is that it 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 was nothing came of it. Is that correct? Does anybody know? I, I don't know that anything came of it. But as far as I know, there is a winner, but nothing happened. Oh, Maybe there I'm... is a winner. Okay. Well, I should uh, say that Antonio and I share one thing, very important thing in common. We both have worked with Stan Ekstad, and what you see in a lot of this is the influence of Stan, which has to do with the public realm being the thing that has the most value. And buildings should have a very significant idea of how they contribute to the public environment. And that, to me, has, has, has informed and, and articulated my professional point of view for some time now. Um, and I think Antonio work for Stan long before I did, but but it's really an important way of understanding it. And he's been one of the most brilliant sort of advocates of that. Somebody's got their hand up there. Yeah, Berke Baibash, please. Uh, I think as far as I know, the taxing project has been took over by the government. So they won't let the uh, municipality to execute the project that was chosen. So that's the most recent news about this area that I know. So I want yeah. to see information. I, I heard that too, actually, yeah. Um, and I don't remember the winner. It, was, it wasn't us, though, so, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had a great time. We I love Istanbul. Istanbul is one of the most interesting places I've ever been. Um, and it was a lot of fun. We have several Turkish employees who grew up in, in Istanbul. And so it was really a lot of fun for them to work on the competition as well, because they knew Taxing Square very well. 
Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, by the way, Matt, whenever you want to come and visit, you will be always very welcome. Oh, I would. I listen. I any excuse to get to Istanbul would be great. Um, it's really one of the most marvelous cities I've ever been to. Um, you know, and we did we did years ago when I was consulting with another firm a piece of Bacchusir, which was interesting, very interesting. But um, the Taxi Square competition was a way for us to sort of talk about Istanbul and learn about the history of Taksim and this part of town. And it was really, we did it during COVID, of course. Mm. So it was something for our young people to sink their teeth into during during the pandemic, you know. Uh, if that might help, we have won the U.S. Amb Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation Award 2022 for the preservation of a church called Panagia Paramitia in Istanbul. So in the next three years, we should be working with that project. If any one of your faculty uh, is into preservation, survey, blah, 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 that kind of thing, we have to, we will have to organize an international summer school on that topic, and we have funding for that, so we could host people, uh, not now, next year, perhaps. But also, we have these uh, architecture and archaeology programs running, so if in the future, you know, it could be a good chance for you to come and visit, I'm saying. But you can come. Well, we should try and plan something, you know, maybe some exchange between your university and ours and do some charrettes together like we did in Stabia. Would be yeah, we, we can do, I mean, we can do lectures, duties, workshops, seminars, moreover, and what is it called? M M O U, um, right. Mutual Understanding Agreement. And um, yeah, so I, I would I would love to. Okay, do we have any other comment or question within the audience? So our students in this studio are designing the Museum of Galata on the Galata waterfront. So I think you have provided a number of very useful um, suggestions for how to treat the waterfront. Moreover, on how to treat public buildings, especially for the uh, elevation design that was, in my opinion, quite um a good example for our students how to deal with you know the facade of a public building which is not a housing project it's something different it should uh, stand at a different scale in terms of figure on to the public space or onto yeah this is the very one uh slide i had in mind so you see there there's a different scale of the uh signs on the facade uh, it has to do with uh, function, light, etc. But it has to do with figure. It's it's about meaning. It's a public building. It's not you know uh, housing, right? So I thought and, that was interesting. Yeah, and the community very much. This is the most popular neighborhood library in Washington before we made the new building, and the community very much took an active role in wanting to see it look like a library they wanted to they wanted to know it was a library and not something else so there you know the, the that whole symbol system of scale and mm -hmm. whatnot even though you know we're architects and we think we're trained for it many people are attuned to that as well they see things in those ways you know i think it was louis sullivan writing that building speak it's about learning how to listen you know what they say <laughs> In, in kindergarten chat, there's this, you know, uh, chapter about buildings speaking. And uh, I grew up on, on that book myself. Yes. So I think yeah, buildings well, do speak, you know. I don't know. I totally agree with you. And Sullivan had a lot of wise things to say. The, the other thing, too, that was important, which was interesting from the client point of view, was the client said, what you get when you design these libraries, you get a very generic program. And they want you to customize it to the neighborhood. So you have a process you go through with the neighborhood to make it programmatically and, and visually something that they see as part of their, their neighborhood. It's very, very nice way the library does, the library system does libraries. Yeah, it seems like you have done this extensively with the materials on the facade, not only here, but in the other projects. You know, like bringing in the building some chromatic material aspects of the neighborhood so to make it blend in on one side but also stand out on the other side 
but not yeah. too much, not too that's, much. That's a very astute observation. I think the building tries to do that, where it, where it, it can be read as something very, you know, from one side, the scale is very big when you look at it from the outside, you know, but, but that's part of the scale of a public building too, you know. But but the but the facade along the street tries to present something that is, if not totally in scale with what's there, something that relates to it in terms of the rhythm of the bays and the, the way the corner works and things like that. But most definitely it does belong to this place in, in form, uh, color, material, rhythm, and so on. There's a raised hand, Luis Martin Domingo. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for the very good presentation. I would like to make a question to the different project. Is the one from uh, Macmillan uh, in relation also with Taksim. In the Taksim project, I saw that one of the uh, aims was to gain in green space. Uh, and in the in the Macmillan, I saw a little bit the opposite because you were a, a party starting from a big uh, green space. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. If, I am not very familiar with Washington DC about how I see, I think I see Washington, uh, Washington DC has more green space that um, Istanbul has, but uh, mm, what was the logic behi behind, I mean, taking this green space out and also leaving this uh, a small uh, part of these old uh, buildings and maybe not going into more um, living and trying to uh, protect old infra uh, infrastructure? That's a great question, and it was one of the um, issues that was at the heart of the approach because people, there were people who wanted the entire site to be preserved as a park. And the, um, the problem with it is, as a park um, at 25 acres, it would probably be too big for the neighborhood. Um, and so what we ended up with was a park of about six acres a little more than six acres, which is larger than any open space um, in most of the DC neighborhoods. So the park that did result was much larger. The interesting thing was there were three prongs to the project, preservation, open space, and development. And we tried to keep them in balance because the city wanted the site developed because they want the tax revenue and they need to supply housing for people in the city. DC has a tremendous housing problem, okay? So what the plan evolved towards was a balance between preserving the above grade elements that you could see, some of the below grade elements, providing a lot of open space, and believe it or not, 50% of the site is open space, but not all in one place, and then having enough development to make a lively neighborhood. So it, it really was trying to find a way to thread the needle among all those three things. And I'd like to think that, that we've done that. It, it certainly took a lot, of, a lot of doing, but it's a good question because in Taxim, we felt the solution was really to make a bigger park because Taxim is a regional park. It's, a, it's something that is at the scale of the entire city, whereas this is something at the scale of the neighborhood. It's a very different idea of scale. So that was our approach. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, Professor Kamis, I, um, I'm very happy to see you and your students and your colleagues. And um, I hope we can, uh, we'll certainly have you come this fall over Zoom and, and present your talk on typology and whatever else you wanna talk about because I'm doing urban design in the fall. So that would be something really special for us. And, um, you know, I hope to get to Istanbul sometime again there. Okay. If, if there, if any of you people listening here have any more competitions about Taxi Square, let me know. <laughs> we will indeed. It's uh, funny to, to learn that you live uh, close to Chevy Chase, where my aunt used to live, Carol Sutherland. Now she is in a retirement retirement home. But that I, I went there several times, Chevy Chase. Oh, so no that's kidding. close. Uh, almost neighbors. Anyhow, we will be in touch. And I again, I sent you the email of Cohen at Vermont, yes, got it. The, the, the Philly guy. So thank you very much for your uh, lecture. We might now...